So Proverbs 27, 6, and there's a handout that, uh, that's out there um, that they were passing around. But we're familiar with the phrase tough love. Uh, and tough love is, a, is, a, is, a, is something that, that we hear sometimes from something, some people, something they do. And uh, by definition, it says this. It says, it is described as an affectionate concern expressed in a, expressed in a stern or unsentimental manner, especially to promote responsible behavior. So words like, you'll find out the hard way, or don't say I didn't warn you, right? These are kind of expressions we use when we say we let, we let people learn, you know, through the hard knocks of life. And so in today's Proverbs, you know, and, and maybe that's the only kind of, uh, the only way, the only love or the only way that you can relate to that. Maybe that's the way you were born. Uh, but today's uh, proverb, we're going to see that this, this correction and teaching is, is similar, but it, it is different in that it, in the motivation and the goal of it and, and, and our preparation for it um, really is different. It's not just a, a, a cast off, you know, at, at times tough love can be characterized by distance and coldness um, and not really a concern. So that's not what the, the, this proverb is talking, talking to us about this morning. So Proverbs 27, 6 says this. It says, faithful are the wounds of a friend, uh, profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Okay, so a wound or a kiss, right? Took a poll, who would rather have what, right? Obviously, we're going to avoid the wound, right, and, 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 and favor the kiss. Um, and this proverb is written in what's called an antithetical style. In other words, it presents two truths, but it's but they're opposite to each other, uh, right, back, back to uh, back. To back. Um, but they teach us some important tr uh, truths in our lives. So if we were going to sum, sum up Proverbs 27, 6, it would say this. It's that this, these words of scripture follow the pattern of imparting God's wisdom, uh, specifically around receiving admonishment, right, correction, or even rebuke from another, and a warning to be wary of those who seek to affirm our decisions, often as a cover for their own guilt. So we see the two, the two different uh, uh, styles here of, of communication, right? So today's uh, study is really kind of un under the umbrella of communication. And it's not the first time that we've talked about communication uh, as, as we've studied through Proverbs. Uh, and communication is really important, right? So like for, for me and if you, and maybe for yourself, if you've ever worked at a, at a company, if you had a, a model or a, a, a statement, a mission statement, right? The communications is always kind of a top priority for, for the company. Um, because why is it? Well, it provides transparency between management and employees, right? So everybody knows is on the same page, and there's not any secrets or or veils or, or anything like that about what's happening. Uh, it also reveals the ongoing status of projects, right, between employees and management. Everybody knows that everybody's pushing in the right direction. It facilitates learning about mistakes, and it's with the goal of preventing the same ones to reoccur. Right? This is specifically in the in the terms of safety. Um, communication is super important, right? Because we want to learn from uh, from mistakes so that they don't occur again. Again, I'm talking about kind of in a business setting, a commercial type setting. And then it provides instruction and guidance for the good of the employee and the company. So the good communication generally means the company uh, does not suffer, the employees do not suffer from a lack of, uh, lack of knowledge, right? So where there is no open communication, the company suffers, the employees suffer. Likewise, communication is also very important for the Christian in the role as husbands, wives, sons, daughters, to parents, to children, and as members of the church. And so concerning communications, we have previously discussed in several, we've looked at several Proverbs talking about this, how, how communication is wise, right? It, it, it's wise instruction. Proverbs 11:14 told us about the wisdom of seeking out counsel. It said, where there is no guidance, the pupil falls, but an abundance of counselors, but in a in an abundance of counselors, there is safety, right? So again, the wisdom of seeking out counsel, right? We're not going at it alone. The wisdom of seeking out the right counsel is another, is another proverb we studied. It says, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the, the companion of fools will suffer harm. So not only is it important that we seek counsel, but that we don't seek the right kind of counsel. Um, we, 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 we drift off with those.
things that are, that are around us. Um, and certainly, you know, probably all of our all of our parents have given us a version of that thing of that of that phrase. Tell me, you know, who you who you hang out with, and I'll tell you who you do live with. Right? Sounds better now, right? Um, right. <laughs> um, but uh, that's that's the idea, right? Of who who you who you walk with. And then finally, uh, the wisdom of not isolating the counsel. Proverbs 18.1, we read, whoever isolates themselves seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. So isolating ourselves, as Nick said, needs good counsel. Wise counsel means to keep or left to our own devices. And we know scripture tells us about our hearts are deceitful, draws us away, we are prone to sin and to wander. So uh, wisdom tells us that we need to Get together and, and to seek out wise counsel, and we see that through these uh, through these scriptures that it's it's clear that that's what God intends for us. That's what He wants us to do. So then, finally, there then, why is it important? Why is communication important in the, in the church setting? Well, let's make some decisions. Specifically, this verse. How does it tie in to uh, what we uh, what's important in the church? Well, Matthew chapter eighteen gives us the procedure and the authority for the church to practice discipline, right? It's how the body of believers provides correction and reproof and protection of the member. Uh, and this is all done, done in the hope of restoration of the member, right? So it's, it's very vital to a healthy church uh, that, that, uh, that there is discipline, godly discipline and correction. But the first step is what? When we read uh, Matthew 18, it says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you if he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Right? It's the same idea. So somebody must go tell, and somebody must listen uh, to begin that process. Right? Repentance and restoration. And so communications is the cornerstone of godly discipline. And without this first step, that sin will grow uh, unchecked. So, like anything in Scripture, then um, that we are told to do by God, there's there's going to be a right way right way and a wrong way to do it. Um, and so that's what we're going to look at today. Uh, we, will, we must look to scripture to discover the wisdom for our life for the right way to communicate and to teach uh, Proverbs 27, 6. So kind of the, 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 uh, the areas we're going to look at as we, as we walk through this proverb is we're going to look at preparation. Uh, when we talk about, uh, initially we're going to talk about the wounds of a friend. What does that mean? Friendly wounds, uh, faithful wounds of a friend. What does that mean? Well, that means, you know, how do we approach our, our fellow brother or sister um, with a hard truth, right? A truth that, that, that needs to be heard. Well, there's, I believe there's four things that, that are important there that, uh, that we'll, we'll look and the scripture will show us. It's preparation. Uh, it's the motivation. Uh, it's our approach. And then it's faith. Um, and so that's kind of what's laid out in, in the handout. So we're going to be talking through that first here. Um, if we back up one verse, it's Proverbs 27, 5, we read this. It says, better is open rebuke than hidden love. So what does that word, what does that mean? It says, in other words, a love that refuses to correct a friend is of no value. Uh, we may have many acquaintances that we know, but, but uh, most of us have got some, some close friends, right? Obviously family, people that are invested in us, people that that are invested in our life, right, that, that care about, about, about how our lives are going, care about decisions we make. And the important role of a true friend and a faithful friend is being sometimes telling others the hard truth that may not be their best interest, right? Hard to, comes with a meal every now and then. Being a, being a good friend, you have to, have to be, be able to, um, uh, to do that and be willing to do that. So open rebuke is what Proverbs 27, 5 uh, talks about. So open rebuke. That refers to confronting somebody's misbehavior frankly and truthfully. It's not beating around the bush, but it's clear and it's deliberate. It may be perceived as harsh or wounding to the recipient, right? I didn't want to hear any of that. I'm wounding someone. But when the intent is to promote another person's well-being and help them change their behavior, the real motivation is love. Rose then says the first half of Proverbs 27 6 is faithful are the wounds of a friend. So 
Open and honest communication is a characteristic of faithful, of a faithful and loving relationship. Right? Again, going back to communication, it's not just any relationship, whether it's a friendship or a, in a marriage or a relationship between a, a parent and a child or a, a child and a parent. Um, that communication is a characteristic of faithful communication. Open and honest communication is so faithful and loving that it's not just something that can be achieved. So faithfulness is an attribute of God. Right? We know that God is faithful. We know that he is. We believe that he does. Um, and that his word is unfolded. But it's one of the gifts that we receive from the Holy Spirit who is the leader of the church and leader of our lives. And it's marked by steadfastness, consistency, and boldness. Those are some of the marks of being a faithful believer uh, that we receive from the Holy Spirit and the Spirit who is the leader of the church. But in contrast, apathy, apathy is the opposite of the motivation of faithful communication. It shows itself as a relationship that is outwardly accepting and approving, uh, but does not address the underlying issues of sin. So it's kind of a pat on the back, and it's just like whatever you do you, and I'll do me, and you live your life, and you know you can make your decisions. I'll, you know, you're on your own kind of thing. It's, it's really an apathy. It's, it's a not wanting to be invested, not really wanting to look out. It's maintaining a surface level type friendship and, and relationship. Many, many grievous sins that you might have been averted if only someone would have had the courage um, to slit the wound of truth to get another one in. Right? That uh, when we look at, we examine our own lives or we see people, people around us, people that we love, I think we can, we can relate to that. We can relate to the fact that um, a, a wise word, a wise word of wisdom may have averted a lot of, a lot of pain and suffering and so that's the, that's the goal of what we're trying, trying to learn here. And so it begins with preparation. Uh, as, we, as we recognize this, uh, uh, this need to confront, uh, uh, to be a faithful friend and to confront sin, then it begins with our preparation. Right? The first step is preparation. It's easy to take this role and, and, and say, well, you know, I'm going to become critical, super critical, or I'm going to nitpick um, and, and really deliver these things in a hurtful way. Right, in, 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 a, in, a, in a harmful way uh, when we start talking to this person. But we're repeatedly told by Scripture that our motivation for correction should first be our love for one another and our hatred of sin and our concern for others being caught in the snare of sin. Right? That we recognize that sin, like David recognized right in Scripture, that, that his sin was before God. Uh, and there was collateral damage but initially, but his, his sin was primarily to God. And so that should drive us in our own repentance in our own lives. Um, it should also be our concern for, for, for our fellow uh, believer or fellow friend or brother um, of what they're doing, of the sin that they are, that they are, uh, that we perceive, right, that, that they are committing uh, with the enemy of God. And so it's been discussed before, one of, one of the first biggest parts of preparation is to check ourselves. Check ourselves, check our motivation, and self-examination, prayer, and ask the Lord to give us some guidance about, about our own lives. Um, Matthew 7, you know, talks about that, verses 3 through 5, it talks about, uh, this is verse 3, it says, uh, why, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? And it further goes on to tell us to kind of examine ourselves. We can be uh, very, very um, efficient spec uh, uh, inspectors, <laughs> for lack of a better word, right? We can, we can, we can find those all around us. But uh, how often do we turn that, you know, turn those uh, that introspection back on ourselves and, and really examine ourselves? And certainly, do we do it before we seek to speak or to consider these things before we act and before we speak the word uh, to someone else? And so. Preparation is key. Preparation takes prayer. It takes really uh, uh, understanding, really making sure that uh, what, we're, what we're acting on or what we're speaking is not just uh, content, but that it's uh, that uh, we don't just, again, knee-jerk reaction to something we see or something we hear, but we, we see a pattern. We see a pattern or maybe uh, we hear you know, other voices speak uh, of some of the concern, maybe other voices speaking sin in, in, in the life of a of a fellow believer, but they are reluctant to bring bring it up. And how you see the same pattern, how you see the same action or behavior, now you see a pattern, right? So 
you're not just acting acting uh, you know off the cuff kind of thing, right? You're you're really uh, considering this stuff before you even get to the point of uh, speaking on it uh, and you're examining your own heart. But our motivation then uh, should be a, a, out of love for our fellow believers. And Ephesians chapter 4 verse 15 tells us that we should be rather speaking the truth in love and we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. So we know that we don't, we're not conformed to the image of Christ automatically by being, uh, by, 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 by just sitting there, right? We have to, con- to be conformed is an action, right? It's an action verb, right? And that takes being, being to hear, hear the truth, you know, hear the truth through the teaching of God's word um, and speaking the truth to each other. Uh, but we do it in love. And, and in that way, because love, again, is true love is the love that we get from the Father and the Spirit. Um, and that is, that is the, the method, that is the, the means by which God, God has uh, works through us um, and through the church to grow each of us into the image of, 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 of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse uh, 4 through 6, uh, talking about love, right? It says love, uh, verse 4 says love is patient and kind. Uh, it does not envy or, or, or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. Does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. So I think that's that's key and, and kind of foundational to what we're talking about here. Is that if we're motivated by love, then then all of these things need to be uh, evident uh, as we again uh, pr- prepare to confront uh, our brother um, with with a uh, with a hard truth. Right? That that truth needs to be spoken. Number one, we need to be patient. We need to be kind with our words. Um, uh, it doesn't have to be an attack, right? Um, we should not boast of ourselves or or um, or, or put ourselves over uh, the person we're talking to. Uh, you know, we don't speak in an arrogant manner, uh, as if uh, you know we're, we're we're above others. Uh, we're not rude in, in our speech. Uh, it's not an excuse to be rude or hurtful. Um, and you know, it doesn't uh, insist in its own way, right? So it's not that I'm coming to a brother with my thoughts, with my uh, my ideas of, of where, uh, you know, where this sin may be and what the what the correction is. But it's this understanding that our correction always needs to go back to Scripture um, as we move as we move forward after that conversation. Um, and so again, it does not rejoice in wrongdoing, right? We don't, it doesn't give us joy to see this stuff, uh, but we rejoice when we see this stuff and others coming to the truth. So it's in this way that we mirror the motivation and the actions of our Lord. Uh, Proverbs uh, chapter 3 verse 12 says this, it says, for the Lord reproves him who, whom he loves as a father the son in whom he delights. So again, it's this, this, this uh, the father is, is, uh, reproves the son in whom he loves and in whom he delights. This is, this is how the Lord reproves us. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 6 tells us this, it says, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. So we know that this, this, this idea of being of having reproof in our life and correction it's not, doesn't mean that we failed. It, it, it means that we're, we're grown, right? Just like a child, just like you train up a child. It doesn't mean that they, they, they failed. We don't, we don't give up on them, right? That's, that's, that's the first step. We, we encourage them and we show them and, and, we, and we continue to give them information and help them. Um, and so that is what uh, the Lord does for us, and that should be our motivation in love as we uh, confront uh, our brother. Speaking the truth in love is what matures the body. It, it holds it together and builds it, it builds it up. Uh, without it, we remain as infants. That's what uh, what Ephesians 4, verses 14 through 16 kind of tell us, that, uh, that we can't remain as infants. We need to grow, and then speaking the truth in love is vital for that growth. We're called to help each other to conform to the image of Christ. This is our motivation. So we looked at our preparation and our motivation. Um, so now we get to the, the rubber meets the road, right? This is our approach. Now, 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 how we, how do we handle that conversation? So our approach should be characterized by kindness and gentleness, uh, which are the, again the fruit of the spirit. And Galatians uh, chapter six verse one tells us this. It says, "Brothers." anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Okay, 
uh, keep watch on yourselves, lest you too be tempted. And so, again, uh, we approach not in a, not in the reaction of the flesh, right? Because you know that the flesh can react in unpredictable ways, uh, but we react, uh, and we are carry, and we are um, guided by the Spirit, right, um, to restore Him in a spirit in a spirit of gentleness. And then that last piece is important because that goes back to that preparation part, right? Um, keep watch on yourself, right? Lest you be tempted. So we need to examine ourselves as we approach this issue of sin, because sin has the it has the um, the characteristic of wanting to ensnare all of it, come come close to it, right? To draw others in and try to and try to motivate or change your ideas of what you're trying to do. You may go into a conversation with a with a good intent and end up at the end of the end of the conversation, hugging it out, and, and nothing's changed, right? And so, or, or maybe you've even you've come off of your sin. And so, we have to be careful about that, um, and um, and keep watch over ourselves. Ephesians chapter 4, going back to Ephesians 4, verses 31 and 32, says this, it says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, Forgiving one another as Christ forgave you. And so again, in our approach, our approach when we deal with this, and so I'm going to bring up this um, this topic here is uh, the wounds of a faithful friend, right? Speaking speaking the truth in love. In our approach, uh, should we should be one again of, of of kindness, again, not of wrath, not of anger, um, not of slander, not of putting down or calling them out. How could you do this? I can't believe you did this. Because um, we can. We should believe that we're all capable of, of any of these things if we are if we put ourselves in the proper place. Our mindset should not our mindset should not be of superiority, of condemnation, but of humility, knowing full well that we are just as prone to fall as our brothers. This reinforces the importance of prayer for one another. Right? We should prepare and examine ourselves on how we will approach our brother or sister, and so that should characterize our approach, right? This kindness, um, gentleness, um, again, uh, motivated by love, approach in a kind and gentle fashion after we have prepared in prayer and sought the Lord's leading. And that leads us to our goal. Our goal should be for repentance and for restoration to our brother or sister. Second Timothy chapter two verse twenty five says this. Uh, in, in correcting his opponents, correcting his opponents with gentleness, God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge, leading to a knowledge of the truth. And I think that's a, a key point. As as we're invested in this conversation, of uh, we're the ones inflicting the wound, per se. Uh, that you know the answer it, it doesn't rest on our sh- shoulders, right? Uh, our our job, uh, what we've been called to is to speak the truth love uh, and for the hope of restoration, but it is it is God who provides that that repentance, provides that gift of repentance to a person. Uh, so it's not on our shoulders. It's not on our shoulders to spit out or to, to feel the weight. Obviously, we feel the weight of, of our sin, uh, but it after we've spoken the truth, you know, it's 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 you know God God at work in their lives and whatever God's will is for that situation to come to pass. Uh, but we know that we've done our part. We've, we've spoken the truth. We've, we've given guidance. It doesn't mean it, it's one and done. It means that we can continue to be there uh, for continued conversations and continued truth. Um, but that weight, that burden of, of restoration doesn't fall on us. That, that, that is between that person and, and God, and that is the, the work of, of God in that person's life. And, and we pray that God may grant them Eleven twenty nine tells us this: Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. And you know that's our prayer: is that with this truth, that, that this person can find rest, can find can find their rest in Christ and in the truth of Christ, uh, because we know that sin is burdensome; it, it wears us down, it is heavy in our lives, um, it, it drives our bones, right? It uh, it does all these things. Killing us, right? Uh, it's, it's dead, but um, 
that's what we would we would pray for that restoration of that direction of the sun that God has given us and that sun will shine on us and give us that light. So the great reward and motivation that gives us hope is that we will see our brothers recognize their sin, seek the Lord, repent, and be restored. We have enough in that capsule. That is that is that is our goal. That's our motivation, our preparation, our approach, and our goal as we seek to improve um, and inflict these what may be perceived as wounds by the other person, right? Because nobody wants to hear it. I don't want to hear it. You don't want to hear it. It has to be said. Uh, and that's that's what being faithful to our friend is about, is that we're seeking to do that. So for the person who is on the other end, right, the, the person with the, with the ears, not the mouth, but what was listening to uh, to this reproof or this rebuke, um, what about them? Well, they need to have a desire for repentance and be able to get to a point where they have a desire for that restored sense. It doesn't come naturally, right? We, you know, we don't want to be corrected, we don't. Uh, but again, it comes from uh, keeping our, our, our mind on the spirit and, and not the flesh. Um, we see in scripture examples of how David, who, who was characterized as a man after God's own heart, he sought correction and he welcomed it. In Psalm 141, he gives you his prayer to the Lord, that he would, that the Lord would guard David's mouth and his heart from going on to evil. And it's with that attitude that he welcomed the rebuke right again. So we're going to read a little bit of this in Psalm 141, verse 5. It says, let a righteous man strike you. There's that wound, right? Let a righteous man strike you. It is a kindness. Let him rebuke you. It is an oil for my head. Let my head not rebuke you. So this idea and this picture of oil being being anointed with oil, and this is the way that that uh, travelers were greeted when they came to a to a friend's house uh, in this time, and that that oil signifies a refreshment, right? Uh, and a fragrance, and so it's a refreshment, a fragrant refreshment of the heart that David is talking about here by being in the presence of the Lord. Um, Chapter 7, verse 36, gives the account where he was chastised and beaten for some reason, and he was not, 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 even, not even given the back greeting of anointing and oil. Uh, his sin was still there. And we must remember that sin separates us from God, but repentance brings us back into a state of grace. And this is the lesson that David learned from his own sin, and a rebuke from someone who pierced him uh, was the fruit of his own action. How did, he, how did he get, how did David get here? He didn't get here just by accident, right? He came he got here not only through obviously what the Spirit led him to, but also through his own through his own actions and his experience uh, firsthand. In one of scriptures clearest examples of rebuking sin in a way that is possible through rep- repercussion is the account of how the prophet Nathan exposed David's sin with Bathsheba to his face. After telling him a story, right, it's a Sad little story that he, that he tells them about a, a powerful man taking something of great value from another, um, and he and, and David is you know he's 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 on every word right and um, and um, David David pronounces judgment for this uh, for the man in this story for this person who deserves death for what they've done they've done a great wrong, um, and it's in that instant that, that Nathan then brings the message home. Right, and he says in Second Samuel, uh, verse chapter twelve, verse seven, it says this. Nathan said to David, "You are the man." Right, and so in an instant, he kind of David recognizes that the the story that he's carrying, right, now ha- is is real. It's real in his own heart. It's real in his own life. Um, and you know, some would say, "Well, you know, uh, Nathan tricked David, right, into in, by this story." Uh, you know, the old uh, bait and switch routine, right? But, but really, uh, I think when it comes back, it comes back to showing us the wisdom that Nathan showed in his preparation, right, of knowing who he was approaching um, in, an, in a way that, again, in, in a way that, that shows gentleness and kindness. He gives him a story, doesn't come right off the bat and, 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 and to his face with this truth, but helps, helps him understand what, what's about to be spoken to him. I think it points back to, to for us, it's a, it's a great example of how, how preparation and understanding how we're going to approach someone um, is very important. Uh, because obviously, you know, Nathan's life was on the line here. Right? Nathan's, Nathan's 
Ochre, who was a native, wanted to, as, uh, as a king, wanted to um, prosecute corpus delicti. Uh, so he treads, he treads lightly, but then you see after that, he, he lays into David. He says, you know, by the word of the Lord, these are the things you've done. Right? Um, so it does, it's not that he withheld the truth. He just, he just kind of eased into it, right? And so that's what you see in the Chronicles 24 and 25. And David's response was one, was one of repentance. Right? After the bitter truth of his, of his sin was laid before him, he says this in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 4, verse 16. He says, David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And, um, and then you see from there what the repercussions of that sin was. Nathan tells him, you're not going to die. Um, you know, your sins have been forgiven. So there, there's this real repulsion from the king. Um, now, if we, can, if we keep reading to the next chapter of, of 2 Samuel, then we see another account. We won't go deep into it, but this is the account of uh, Amnon and, and, and Tamar. Uh, there's a situation there where, you know, there's this sinful desire within Amnon's heart, and it's just brewing, and, and it's raging, and what he needs is someone to speak truth to him. He needs somebody that needs to speak to, to, to get him off that cliff that he's about to, to, to jump off over and, and give him sound wisdom and advice. Instead, he, he doesn't get that. Instead, he gets Jonadab, who you know, fans the flame uh, of his desires and, and, and gives him a way to, to accomplish it. And so we see after that a, just a, a great, uh, a tragic, a tragic uh, account of, of what happens to Tamar. And um, so this kind of takes people back in uh, to what we're talking about, and that's just that, that need for, um, for those wounds of a friend. Tragic things can happen to us, and so we need to have that that friend that we can uh, we can talk to about those things. Somebody doesn't step up and and, and do that, and that's not what David did. But it brings us to the question, right? Why is it difficult, right? It's easy. We we see this, and we can say it, but it's but it is difficult for us. How would we have responded if we were Nathan? If we were given that charge to speak to to, to the king, would we have had fear of rejection or persecution? Would our pride have prevented it? Uh, you know, not wanting to examine ourselves or confront our own sin. Um, would that have helped? That would that have held us back? Um, would it cause us to avoid that difficult conversation? And the answer is yes, yes, and yes, because all of these things, these things are holding us back. Um, these are the things that we have to to fight against and, 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 and pray for. Uh, and these these things that that would keep us from from taking that. See some accounts in Scripture. Um, the Apostle Paul, right uh, in Galatians chapter two, verses eleven through thirteen, he tells of confronting Peter, um, and he he's going to have to rebuke Peter in public, uh, pretty uh, pretty sternly here, uh, but he does it you know, without fear of losing his friendship. And uh, and the reason he does it is only because it's it's not a trivial matter uh, that Paul was uh, was going at, but it's because Peter's actions. Uh, were in opposition to his teaching and in opposition to the gospel, right? He was, he was, uh, he was having the Gentiles would, uh, you know, he, we're, we're taught in our doctrine and what, what scripture tells us is, you know, how are we justified? Are we justified by faith? The Bible says not by works, but by faith alone. But yet in the words and the actions of Peter, it was kind of signifying something else, that the, the, the Gentiles kind of had to be like the Jews uh, in order for them to, to, to be saved, um, not have been what he was saying, but his actions were in, in contradiction. And so Paul sees a, Paul sees a great, um, you know, concern for this. So in, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 11 through 14, we, we read this, starting in verse 11 of Galatians chapter 2. It says, but when uh, Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from for before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they come, but, but when they came, he drew back and separated themselves, fearing the circumcision of heart. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically al- along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hip- hypocrisy. But when I saw that hi- their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said, I said to Cephas before them all, "Do you?" Though a Jew live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to do the same? So, you know, 
call him, he'd call him out because, you know, he, there's a peer pressure, right, as the, this party of circumcision, the Jews and the Gentiles must be circumcised uh, by faith. And, you know, he, he allowed that pressure to influence his actions. And so this was, this would have been, this was causing great, great harm, right, uh, in, in the sins of his alleged Barnabas. So we see that he had a, a valid, you know, as, as he considered before he confronted the sin of, uh, like we talked about in that preparation series, he knew the, the weight of what the, what the situation was going to you know, play out it as and the importance of what he needed to face. And we, let, we later see in, Paul, in Peter's writings that, you know, after that confrontation, that might be something that sticks in our heart, uh, sticks in our craw, right? And we're like, you know, man, I heard this from this brother. I'm going to avoid them. I really don't have anything good to say about them. Um, you know, because they, they hurt our pride, right? They wounded us. Uh, but we see that Peter did not lose respect or love for Paul, his brother in Christ. We see in his writings, in uh, his second letter, Second Peter chapter 3, verse 15, he, he says this, and it's not directly uh, uh, in reply to that, to that uh, occurrence, but we, we see how he feels. He says, he says this in verse 15 of Second Peter chapter 3, it says, and, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the faith that was given to him. Right, so he still has a high respect for Paul, even despite this, uh, this interaction and this confrontation. Uh, and he realizes that, you know, uh, that Paul is a, is a, uh, a fellow beloved brother. And that should be our reaction. John Gill wrote this. He said, friendly wounds, that is, friendly reproofs, which, though they may be severe, at least he thought so in human strength, and may grieve and wound and cause pain and uneasiness for the present, if you hear them right now, and bother us a lot. Yet, proceeding from a spirit of love, faithfulness, and integrity, and designed for the good of the person being reproved, ought to be kindly received. A lot of, a lot of old Old words there, to, you know, a lot of words there to, to throw in there, but it's basically saying, you know, we need to, like David understood in Psalm uh, 141, that we should kindly receive them, right? receive them, and we should not push against them or uh, oppose them, uh, because when we know that they come from a spirit of love, uh, faithfulness, and integrity, and they're designed for our good, then they're really beneficial to us. So that's, uh, that, that kind of encapsulates uh, the first part of Proverbs 27, 6, about the wounds of God, right? This, uh, this, this instruction there uh, about uh, the purpose of God, that, uh, of how we're to be wounded. But on the flip side, right, the second half of this proverb says this, uh, Proverbs 27, verse 6, the second part, it says this, so few are the kisses of an enemy. John Gill goes on to say, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. They flow from a deceitful heart. They are not to be confided in as the kisses of Joab and Judah. Right? We can see this. Reckon them faithful not to praise everything thou sayest or doest. Right? Don't, don't, don't reckon faithful as, as one that is always propping you up, but those that reprove, reprove what is amiss. Right? So the ones that, that show you where you're going wrong, those are the ones that you should necessarily the ones that are going to tell you what you need to hear or, or, uh, or ignore uh, your actions. An enemy, on the other hand, may feign or fake love, right? Anyone can be insincere and offer an affirmation regardless of the situation. Uh, this is also often a tactic used to disguise real intent. Uh, it shows itself as a relationship that is outwardly caring but hides an underlying intention of revenge or fear. Right? The surface all good, uh, not enough for the inside, right? That's what we're talking about. And as John Gill mentioned, here's Judas, right? We, we, it's the first one that comes to, comes to mind probably, right? He, he feigned love for Jesus by kissing him, uh, but that kiss wasn't, it was a deceptive kiss, right? It wasn't a kiss of love and affection like the rest that I just uh, touched on, uh, but it was, a, it was a sign or a signal to the soldiers, right, that Jesus was under house arrest. We find that in Mark uh, chapter 14, verses 44 to 46. It says now, verse 44 says, now that, the, now 
Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, One I will kiss with the nail, and he came and went to the room with the guard. And when he came, he went up to him and at once said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. They laid hands on him and kissed him. And so this, this sign of uh, these profuse kisses, right, just going along with, uh, with, the, with the disciples uh, this whole time that Judas was, was uh, uh, providentially uh, the one that was going to betray our Lord. Um, and then we see, and so we see how, you know, these kisses, this kissing here uh, literally kissed him, right? It was, it was used as, as, a, uh, as a deception. We see the same thing in, in, in Joab in Second Samuel. We see the common gesture, right, of a welcoming kiss. Uh, that was customary way to greet a friend. Still, still is, as we see in the Roman culture. Um, how he used that in Second Samuel uh, chapter twenty, verses nine through ten. We see that. It says, "And Joab said to Amasa, Is it well with you, my brother?'" And Joab took and Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him. And Amasa, Amasa did not observe the sword that was in Joab's hand. But Joab struck him with it in the stomach and spilled his entrails to the ground without striking his hand against his skin. All right, so again, another example in scripture, a very, very uh, uh, graphic example here of how, you know, a kiss was used to, for diversion, right, for an ill intent for Joab to kill Amasa. Um, so these profuse kisses of an enemy often they're not always like that, right? That's not the, well, likely not what we're going to find in our lives, right? No, nobody's going to come to us, you know, and, and stab us, uh, uh, you know, or, 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 or have us arrested. You know, that, 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 that doesn't happen. More likely, uh, it's going to be, they're going to come in the words of deception, right, which appeals to our own desires and, and opposition to the righteousness and instruction of God. Paul was instructing Timothy to be on guard for such subtle attacks by the enemy. Second Timothy chapter four verses three and four, he says this: For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. They will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And when you read this, and sometimes I know I did, um, you know, especially when I used to read that that verse, I was like, man, you know, what is the kind of prophecy that you know, what is this time coming when, when, when these things are going to happen? But the reality is. These things were happening then, right? They were happening then. They, they continue to happen. They will continue to, to be happening as we go on. Um, and, that, and that type of deception was on Paul's mind as he warned the Galatian church about false teachers who used flattery to gain, to gain trust and attention, right? They just wanted followers, right? They, 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 wanted, they wanted likes and followers, right, as we would say. Um, but when he told them this hard truth, you know, some of them turned against him because he would use that to, to correct them. And we see this in Galatians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. We read this. This is Paul talking to the church. He says, Have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? They make much of you. That's talking about these others, these others that, that seek to, to, to divide the church. They make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out of the church, that you may make much of them. Right? So their, their goal is not, it's not to, for the un unity of the church, but for division of the church. And so, uh, again, Paul is addressing this fact that, you know, he's got opposition here, right? Have, have I become your enemy just by telling you the truth? Um, so, and I think this is a, this is a, this is an example here that really kind of strikes home here, here in this church, because I know there are several, several that, that attend or that are members here now, right? That, that at one point, uh, were, were meeting in another church, right, hearing other word, um, and, and it was through the, you know, the faithful moves and, and, and discussions of friends that uh, in their ears to, be, to address these things uh, that they, they ended up then questioning and listening more carefully to what the brothers were taught, and eventually they were, they were led, you know, led to our, our congregation. Um, and I'm sure that those those conversations initially probably weren't pleasant. It, you know, there's nothing that you can. Where we worship is a very personal thing, right? Like we, we just feel like if anybody was to dare to to tell us or to uh, uh, make us think differently, that we're going to get that very same attention. Um, but it's it's words of truth because out of love, when we see that if somebody's being uh, uh, guided or led astray from the truth of the gospel, that it has eternal consequences. So that's where. 
uh, that's where those uh, that, that truth has to be spoken. And so, again, I think that's something that, that many, many men in the congregation can speak of at one time in their life of somebody, somebody telling them something they needed to hear um, directly or otherwise about how they worship and worship the Lord. But it's by the mercies of God and his providence uh, for, those, for their lives that some are here today because of the dream that they had about worship. We thank God for that. So we'll wrap it up here. It says, what does this take? What, what does this take? We, we, we've seen what the, uh, what the Lord has shown us in his word uh, and what it is that it takes to be a faithful friend and a partner in you in, in, in the right way. Well, it takes sincerely caring for that friend and not showing apathy, as we talked about, or not, not caring enough about the effect it's having on their life. You know, obviously, you have to have that love, right? That, that, that care. Not being re- fearful uh, that we will be rejected. Um, and that the friendship might be severed. Um, we expect that if it's spoken in love, that we will always trust that whatever the result is, it will be the Lord's will. So again, we talked about that earlier. We have to speak truth to and, uh, and let go, uh, you know, in the sense of not, not holding on and, and for fear of that our words would, uh, you know, would affect the friendship in some way that the Lord has not intended for us to be. And then again, uh, examining ourselves before we approach the Lord, Check our motivation, perhaps identify which are one that the Lord would want us to speak to. Uh, not being reluctant to address another sin for the fear of having to discuss your own sin. Right? So and, and this is actually really important because, like you know, like we said earlier, we, we come to each other in these conversations not really with ideas of well, Lord, if I, how could you do that? It's I've done that. I've I've fallen in this area where I've sinned like that. Let me tell you about about how this uh, how this affected me and how how somebody showed this to me. And that's often uh, a way of disarming that opposition, right? It's, it's a way to, to level that, that, uh, that conversation. So that's what the, the friend would do. Uh, for the friend who would be wounded, right, it, it's important that they would open themselves up, uh, not allow their pride to prevent them from hearing or receiving the truth. So, you know, not everybody's going to get it right when they tell you that, right off the bat. But more than likely, they're on to something, right? And, and, and they're on to something that, that could cause you to, to examine their words. Maybe they didn't get it quite right. Maybe they didn't hit the right sin, but they were close. And uh, so we really need to accept that truth and, and, and self-examine ourselves. And then not allowing embarrassment, if we're the ones being talked to, not, not allowing that embarrassment to keep us from rejecting the truth or keep us or make us reject or deny the truth. And again, this can be used by a, a gentle and kind approach, right? We're, we're approached and we're attacked. We use our defense when we're being attacked. We put up the walls. We don't want to hear it. But again, if we can come into them in a gentle, kind way with love, can, can open up that, that conversation. And then not allowing stubbornness to, stubbornness to keep us from hearing the truth or feeling uncomfortable, right? Sin suppresses the truth. We do not want to acknowledge it. Finally, to avoid being misled by the enemy, be wary of those who will not challenge you or hold you accountable. Seek out fellow believers that you can trust to have your best interests in mind. Um, Church that always tells you how good you are, uh, you know, it's not being faithful to you, it's not being faithful to the scriptures. A brother that's always that's always doing the same thing is not uh, is not examining you, right? Is not examining you. Uh, and pray that the Spirit of God would give you wisdom and discernment to see others' motives. This is not something mystical that we have to we have to we have to think about. This does is what we're hearing. Does it align with Scripture? Is what is is the sin that's being characterized in our life? Is does it align with Scripture? Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it's a con- this is a time for a conversation with somebody's opinion or their preferences being, being put upon us, um, and that's, that's a conversation that needs to be had, right, before there's any kind of bitterness uh, or, or any kind of division because of that. Uh, but if it does, then we need to examine it and discern it. And then finally, pray that the Lord would help you receive the truth spoken in love and that would help us respond in a way that recognizes that our love that person uh, a lot of love and concern for you to speak those words to them and that uh, if, that, if that time comes that you would repent and, and understand it for what it for what it is so that's what I got it's